Our first Bible reading is taken from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13 to 18. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13 to 18. I'm reading from the New International Version. Let us hear the word of God. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God, I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of God. Our second scripture reading is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 to 15. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 to 15. I'm reading from the New International Version. Let us hear the word of God. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. You should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The word of God. That we can sit at your feet, the best option, to hear you speak to us so that we can rise and respond as you will and as you wish. So speak to us this morning and confirm your words by the transformation that will come from it. Not just to soothe our ears, but to drive us onto action even when we close from here. Thank you because you are here. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's a joy to be back to LIC and to have the privilege to share with you again. Today I have a greater motivation for being here because my wife and children decided to come along with me. So it's a blessing to have my wife, Abigail, here this morning. We speak on love one another, love one another. Again, picking from the lessons that we are gathering from the first book of John, that's first John, and uh, brooding over these to hear what the Lord will have to tell us. Before I proceed to mine, I, I know that by now you should know that I always do this whenever I come. I know last week, um, Ozov Ibrahim preached Can somebody help me to know what he preached on? Uh, If you don't give me answers that are satisfactory, we'll just do communion and go. Then we'll maybe tell the technical team to do a recap. What was the theme for last week? You are covering for some people. I want to see your hand. I'm I'm the lecturer now. 
Auntie Christy, Auntie Comfort, yes. Come again, please. Whose child are you? I think there are three key things you mentioned. What was the first one? Now, you know the reason why we become very particular about academics? It's because even if you are the most lazy student, exams or IA will catch you. So we learn not because we are super disciplined with learning. We learn because there's a day of assessment. I think when constantly Christianity becomes a suggestive thing, I think I've said this here before, and every Sunday we want a fresh message. I don't think we help the body. It's one of my brothers I was at Trinity with, and one of the days I watched his message on Facebook. One of the things he has institutionalized in his church. By the time you are coming back a week after, you should have listened to the previous sermon not less than twice. And I think that's a very good thing. And I wish that you are not only able to tell what was said, but we have in our care cells and the area fellowships able to share a bit about how we are working with the things that we gathered. I pray that the fate of my message this morning will not be like many of the messages that we have heard past and gone. Oh, I thought you say amen to that. First John chapter 3, verse 11. The apostle begins with an amazing statement. Because for a truth, how do you feel when you hear we are going to talk about love? It's almost like saying, again? Because this is something that we talk about a lot. Probably the most talked about subject on the pulpit. But listen to what he says in verse 11. He says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. He's virtually saying, this is the foundational message. You heard it then, I'm repeating it now. By implication, it will be repeated tomorrow. This is one of the messages that repetition does not exhaust it. And if even every Sunday we are preaching love, that is the heart of a Christian message. So don't expect anything new from the pulpit today. Rather, I expect a reminder of something we know too much but do very little about. That which you have heard from the beginning, that which you were told, that's exactly what I'm speaking to you about again. Now, the second aspect that I want us to pay attention to, it didn't just say love others, it said love one another. Immediately he uses one another, it means there's a form of participation. It is more like love him, let him love you. It is more of give love and receive love. Love one another means there is an involvement in the community in the love they express. So it is not just a one-sided thing which has its place in scripture. There is a place for just loving and closing your mind, but there is a place where in a community of believers, I wash your feet, Jesus said, you wash my feet, wash the feet one of another. And there's a real reason why he says that. Because I think a lot of times, I struggle with the things that are difficult to do, make us actually close our eyes to the things that are easy to do. For instance, how many times do we not run away from door-to-door -door evangelism and because of that, we even forget that though I might not be confident to walk to somebody's door and knock, there's a little child in my area who always plays football. Who wouldn't need any special protocol before you can speak to the child? So you realize that our fear of the difficult blinds us to the easy. If it would be very difficult to show love to a stranger that walks to your door and say, I'm broke, I need food, I'm not too sure you need a lot of scrutiny if somebody that sits in church with you in LIC walks to you and says, I think I need help. And so though there's the place for general love, 
I think this one is talking about love that exists within the body. Where we are people that there are the evidence that we are genuine, we are not frosters. Nobody wants to take advantage of you. He's saying, love one another. Then he goes ahead to tell us why we should do this. Some reasons why we have been called to love one another. Number one, it is because love is an evidence of a new life we have in Christ. And last week, Ibrahim shared things on that line. Your life of righteousness and purity is an evidence of the new life you have. So is love. And so when you look at the 14a, that is the chapter 3, verse the 14a. I'm reading from the New King James anyway. It says that we know that we have passed from death to life. How do we know? Because we love the brethren. By our love of the brethren, it becomes the evidence that affirms the fact that we have new life. So anybody that walks and love does not come to you as a child of God, that you are not predisposed to loving and showing care, it puts a question whether you have really met this Jesus. His life flows through us. We possess an inner drive to love. It is our new nature to love. Then the 14 B says, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Now, when you are accustomed to hatred, bitterness, contention, you know that there are some people who are very contentious. If you have not lived in a community like that, very contentious, always living like that, self-centered. Every day there is a strife. Tell me what that is. That is nothing but death. You know what death is? Separation. When you live a life where you are separated from human beings, you don't wake up in the morning thinking about somebody but yourself. You don't think about the next opportunity to help somebody and to put a smile on somebody's face. You go about your whole day and the way you relate with your, uh, the, those who are subordinates at work is all to make sure that at the end of the day, you meet your deadlines and gain your promotion. You know what you are doing? You are living an empty life called death. You are separated from the core of human existence, the simplicity of life, where we value human life, and so every day have the joy of being able to minister to somebody and to help somebody. If you've never tried helping somebody before, you probably have no idea of the joy that comes from loving and showing care to others. So that's the first reason why we love, because love is an evidence that we have a new life. That's a natural predisposition after we have been born again. Number two, we love because Christ has set us an example. And we see that in the verse 16. He said, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So Christ has done it and so we do it. You know what that means? It means that the Christian has a, a three-level reason when it comes to Christ's example, for which reason he loves? Number one, he has the experience of love. Now, one of the things that make it very difficult for someone to be able to show love is when they have never tasted of love. And that's why if you observe people, well, the boys' school I went to and the, the bullying. Oh, those days. I'm praying now there's no bullying in senior high schools. Uh, why will I even talk about senior high school when I was here in Legon? I, I stayed out of my, my hall for almost a month and a half because I was a fresh student and they wanted to pond me. Now, this ponding is not child's play where we put water on you. They put sand in that uh, uh, cup, put water in it, and can leave blisters at your back. And every day I saw this and I said, I won't be a foolish boy to stay here for these people to kill me. I went to a family member around at Chimota and that was why I was commuting to school for more than one and a half months. They call it school life, it is called bullying. You know why a lot of people bully? They have never tasted love. We love because Christ has given us the experience of love. He loved us first, so we have tasted what it means to be loved. Then it has given us the motivation to love. Because of what he did, it becomes sufficient motivation. Why are you doing this to me? 
Somebody did something for me far bigger than what I'm doing for you. I have a far stronger, better motivation for loving you. It's not because I need anything from you. If you didn't kill me and strike me down with tender, I had the best motivation to love anybody in the world. And number three, he shows us the example. So we have experienced, we have the experience of love, the motivation of love, and the example of love so that we know the how to. How do I love? Christ's example is the pattern. Number three, the reason why we must love. We must love because it is unpopular to live as a child of light in certain quarters. Verse 13 says it. So do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. The reason why you must love me is because when I step out of church, there's a high possibility I'll drop into an environment of competition, anarchy, tribalism, politics, the gender game. There is a number of women that are suffering in one university or the other just because they rose to become a head of department or a dean. Woman, you think it doesn't happen? I live in an university environment. I'm a pastor in a university church. The point I am making is that the world is most likely going to hate us. So when we come to church and we don't find love, where else will we get love? I love you because probably beyond your family, and it's unfortunate even some of us are not experiencing love within family. To shock you to know that the two hours somebody spends in church is their best moment from Monday to Sunday. So I have no choice but to put up that smile for you for just that short time because out there I cannot vouch that you might be able to know the taste of love. So I love you because it's very unpopular to be loved as a child of God in certain quarters. Finally, the reason why we should love and that I pick it from our first reading from Leviticus. For almost all the instructions and the laws he gave, one of the key statements you end with, I am the Lord. He will give the law. Don't do that. Then you end, I am the Lord. That, that is virtually to say, I am giving you an instruction. Do it. Why? Because I'm in charge. I'm the boss. I'm the master. I've said it. Why should I do it? Because I said it. Why should I do it? Because I am God. You must fear me. Sometimes we love simply because we fear God. And trust me, a lot of times that will be the only thing that will move you to love some people. It's just because you still fear God. But it is a strong reason why the child of God will have to love. Now, John did not just end on giving us the reasons why we should love. He now shifted and gave us a few cautions. I focus on two. Two that are pregnant in themselves anyway. He gave us some do nots. The first one, he cautioned against anger, envy, hatred, and the list goes on. How did he do that? In the verse 12, check what he said. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. He said, why did he murder him? He said, because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be like Cain. What does this mean? There are two issues with Cain here. The first one is his identity. The second one, his actions. One definitely influenced the other. Why did Cain do what he did? Because he was of the evil one. Now, how will you be of the evil one and your actions will not be evil? The more reason why he said it down there, the world will hate you. Because the world does not know Christ, and the one that is not in the hands of Christ is in the hands of a devil. And you will surely do the work as correspond to your nature. You are not recreated. You cannot do things that recreated people do. So the actions of Cain were evil because of his nature. And every one of us who want to go on this journey of true love, and when it was ending, he said it. Love in actions and in truth. 
It means that you can actually show actions that look like love, but you know your motivations are false. They are insincere. It's because you want something back. But for the child of God, you love in truth. And that's very different from the way that Cain loved. Now let's look at the evils of Cain. And when you pay attention to this that he said here in the 13th, in the, in the 12th, you notice that when he says because his works were evil and his brothers righteous, he was not necessarily referring exclusively to the evil of the murder. Because at the point he had committed the murder, why would you compare that action with that of his brother? The boy is dead already. The only point that you could compare their actions was at the point of the sacrifice. This one did this, this one did that. And he said, this one's work was evil, his was righteous. So when the Lord is saying that, or the Bible is saying, and John, for that matter, is saying, we should not be like Cain because his works were evil, then we must pay closer attention. What were the evils of Cain? Number one, the offering of unacceptable sacrifice. Why that was unacceptable, we don't know. But at least what we know is that God told him when he came to him in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. He said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? So though we are not giving details, there is something that guy might not have done well, for which reason his sacrifice was not accepted. And it looks as if he knew it. That's why God will come and talk to him that way. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And some of us have that confidence to walk to God and give him sacrifice as if we are treating our houseboy. Sorry I'm using that, but that's what can come close very much to us because it doesn't mean that our houseboys deserve the inferior. The way we walk to church, the offering we give, attitude to the songs, Attitude to prayer. I am praying there's nobody in the congregation on the phone watching Facebook now that I'm preaching. You know to do well, you'll be accepted. An unacceptable sacrifice. Number two, was the sin of comparison that led to envy. Comparing himself to his brother. Because if there is no comparison, why will you be, why will you be so envious to the point of murdering him? Number three is extreme anger. And the Bible says it's an anger that causes countenance to change. He was very angry that his countenance fell. The next, he ignored the warnings of God. So God comes to him and says, Sin is crouching at your door, must I it? Or it will have you. It wants to have you. And this guy ignores it and goes ahead. And that's what he did. Is that not a familiar storyline? We just ended the Easter. Familiar storyline with Peter and with Judas. The Lord tells you exactly what is going to happen. And you don't behave like the people of Nineveh. Who go in sackcloth and ashes and fast for three days with their animals and say, Tophia, not me. Lord, have mercy. I will not suffer this. But the Lord comes and tells him, sin wants to have you. And Cain goes ahead and sin grabs him. It's interesting. What does that mean? That is a man that ignores the warning of God. Do not be like Cain in loving all of this coming to it. You don't just rise up and begin to love. These are the background things. You see somebody who hates, there are a lot of background factors. And for Cain, these were the background issues. He ignored the voice of God. You know that sometimes the problem is our willingness to heed what God is saying. How many times have we not ignored clear instructions of what we must do? You know the right thing to do. But somewhere, somewhere, you turn a deaf ear. Well, when you do that, you are being like Cain. Last but one, the evil scheming. So in the murder, he invites his brother to the field. Now that's somebody who has planned it. It's well woven out. He's executing his plan. He has taken time to think through it. And he executes it. And finally, he made a sin. Now pay attention to this. The Bible did not just say that he committed murder. But he said he murdered his brother. Does this not make sense in love one another, talking about it typically in the Christian context today? So it is possible to murder your brother 
One of the saddest stories in the Bible is the story of Joseph's sons, Jacob's sons, and their brother Joseph. If ten brothers, not two, not three, ten, ten brothers can team together to kill one little boy. That is sheer wickedness. And Eli I want to draw our attention that it is possible for some of the worst hatreds to exist in the family of brethren. That's why unfortunately some of us at homes are tearing apart. The very person you looked into the eyes and said, so death do us part, you now don't want to see the person. Something went wrong. Some of us don't trust our family members anymore. We can't even go to the village because we know they're after our lives. Whether that is true or not, some of the greatest contentions can exist where brothers and sisters are. Do not be like Cain means be on your guard against the possibility of hating your very brother or sister you sit with in church. Now the caution number two, remember I told you that one was pregnant. So that was the caution against the anger, the bitterness, and all of those things of Cain. The caution number two came in the verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. That's a caution against expecting to be loved, especially by the world. Expectations must always be measured. It's one of the biggest problems when it comes to love relationships. You expected it so high, you entered in there, you realized there's nothing in there. You truly love in church, then don't have too much expectations, especially of those who are not part of this family. It's an important caution to us. In fact, let me add my own and say, even don't expect much of love from within. Do your best. If by God's grace you are able to receive a corresponding or greater love, praise God, that's a church that is growing. But the church that has a lot to do, even when you have shown all the love, is cautioning you here, don't marvel when the world hits you. And he's telling us early enough because when you get surprised at the hatred, it can affect your motivation to love. I won't do this again. Because of this thing that this guy did to me, I will never do this again. And some of us don't trust church people just because of an experience we had with a church person when we employed a person to be our accountant or a cashier. Be careful when you go about speaking about this everywhere that people that don't go to church are more honest than church people. So that's too much of a simplistic generalization. Let's stop it. You are being cautioned here when you don't see love the way you want to see it. It's part of what John is saying, you must be expecting. Don't be surprised when you don't receive love the way it must come to you. So the climax of it, how do we exhibit this love? Number one is to do what we call sacrificial love. And that's in the verse 16, which I've read already. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. That this is too much the Lord is expecting. Listen to the second part. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I know that this can mean a lot because the Jesus laying down his life was complete death. Is that what he's telling us to do? Well, it can be symbolic, but I dare say, there is a possibility in extreme circumstances we could even get there. When you live in a part of the world where you are not used to a lot of kidnapping and today murder, tomorrow murder and all of that, you think these things are only figurative. But in a community of so much persecution and people suffering for their faith, sometimes some of these statements are so literal. Sacrificial love. Some part of love will inconvenience you. And it's part of the way to be able to live out our call to love. Love is not always nice and palatable. It can be incomplete. Trust me. Yesterday in the morning, maybe the Lord felt, because I was coming here, he would give me practical examples. 
I was in my home preparing this message. I have some deadline assignments to submit and some take-home exams. And uh, so I said, to Saturday, I'm locking myself in. Then somebody knocks on the door. Now, there's a good reason why these uh, a lot of churches don't build a mission house close to the church, you know. <laughs> so a young church member walks in. In fact, it took me close to 20 minutes to even go and see her because I was taken completely off balance. I had not even taken my bath. So I had to quickly go do all of that. When I sat down and listened to this young woman, I understood why some part of us should simply give room for a little inconvenience. Just a little. Of course, you must plan if you have the opportunity to structure things around you well, the Jethro's example and the advice to Moses. But even the best structures will still cause you to need to create a place in your heart that can be inconvenienced because of love. Hearing her story and how she shed tears, after I prayed with her and she left, I knew it was worth the one hour that I spent with her. Then I see if the day was over, Late in the night when I got everything ready so that early at dawn I can set off, the usual lights out on one of the streets on campus. The place is dark. Then I see a car registration parked at the side. They were taking their tie out and looks like this, this is familiar. Then I drive past them and then I realize that that is one of the leaders of a church, a woman, and the car, I think she has a flat tie. Well, it was dark. I had to catch up with something at church. Um, there was somebody helping her, so I said, oh, she's fine. But I drove just a few seconds, and I couldn't just contain the idea of passing by. So I stopped some meters away and walked back. She has a flat tire. They've been there for quite a while because the taxi driver trying to loosen the bolts is not, it's not succeeding because the thing is too tight. And so they are wondering what to do. I said, well, let me try it. You know, I'm a bit lanky, but not knowing there's quite some weight, you know. <laughs> Surprisingly, they just put that thing that I stepped on it. Oh! So virtually, I went there to get them from where they were stuck. Now, who was going to stop for those people at that time of the night in that complete darkness? How long did I spend there? Maybe 30 minutes. But I was such a fulfilled man knowing that I was inconvenienced. I had to go do something at church. I paused for 30 minutes and did something they had tried doing for a long time they were not able to solve. He calls it sacrifice. Lay down your life for someone else. And the final thing he said, he said, let us love by our actions, not just by our words. Verse 17 and 18, and that's where I'm ending. In your practical daily life, let us show love. The first reading gives a whole tall list of things that are so practical when it comes to exhibition of love because of time. I don't think I can expand on any of them. But just to read through them. He said, you shall not cheat your neighbor or rob him. He said, the wages of the hired shall not remain with you until morning. He said, you shall not curse the deaf. You know what this means? The deaf also include the one who has language barrier issues. Sends my mind back to when we had some missionaries joining us some time ago for missions. What hard, Jane? I mean, you understand why I put it in that way? If you don't understand, uh, go and they will, they will interpret it for you. What hard, Jane? Do, do. So when it gets to that point where we feel they are too much a bother, we, the few Ghanaian missionaries, will tend to, to the vernacular. We we'll talk our minds and uh, I read here and I realized this is exactly what the Lord was talking about. Do not curse the deaf. Don't say bad things about the person because of language barrier. It is not Christianly ethical. Don't do it. Do not put a stumbling block before the blind. This also includes a stumbling block before the ignorant. Because the person does not know it, you take advantage of it. No stumbling block before the blind. You shall not do no injustice in judgment. In other words, judge your neighbor fairly. I think I spoke about this sometime I came here. This goes beyond legal judgment. 
It goes to daily personal judgment. Every day, we sit as judges on the issues that come to our minds. And most of the times, we don't judge fairly. The very standards we judge others by, we judge our own selves by very completely different standards. We are too critical, and yet we don't want anybody to criticize us. And it goes on and on. You shall not go after, about as a tail bearer. That means you shall not go about spreading slander. Falsehood and character assassination. May the Lord save our nation. Social media has spoiled everything. Can anybody have the boldness to look at any of the revered professors here, Reverend Boama, and sit somewhere and say, last time Reverend Boama preached a message, I didn't agree with him. I think these days our pastors are losing the fire. And you put it straight on church WhatsApp page. You call that democracy? And trust me, as many of us that want to get into politics, I don't think everybody in politics is, is a rotten person. If we don't stop simplifying everything to think that everybody there is corrupt, you will get there as a Christian and you realize the thing was not as little as you saw it. Get to understand why people are there, they fear God, they hold on to integrity, but they are not solving the problems. It goes beyond good virtues. Sometimes the exposure and the technical know-how, when that is missing, you get as an econom economic person, you will crush the economy of our nation. You don't only need tongue speaking to, to prevail as a leader, you need the know-how. Expose yourself to how things are done. I'm only saying that part of love is to reduce the character assassination. You get there, you might do worse. Forgive me, I cannot go on and on because of time. He said, do not revenge. I hope there's no married couple here who your partner is using sex as a revenge. I'm only asking. Other practical ways of loving. And I listed these few because they spoke to me a lot. Church hospital services to members. Not just to visit them and say visiting hours. But I've had a few experiences with our church. Where the church member has no family member who is close by. A young person. And we need somebody from church to be the handsome person that when the nurses need somebody, they call on the person. And we have to work on restructuring our welfare system so that when we hear there's an emergency... Somebody from LIC is, is hospitalized. There's no family member close by. I can conveniently say, boss, can you allow me to stay away from work today? Just to stay at Kolebu. Very inconveniencing. Trust me, I don't say these things easily. They are the difficult part of the pastoral work. Taking a family or a child in to relieve a traveling family. Husband and wife are so tight. Where do we turn with our children? We, can, we must travel. That, that thing has, appointment has come. Let it be easy that they will easily think about you. So as for that sister, when we talk to her, we know that she will take care of this, our child. Let, let them go. And when they are thinking about, oh, I, I hope she's not worrying. So don't worry. If you want to stay a month, stay there. I'll take care of your child. You think that comes easy? It doesn't. Babysitting for newly borns. And some of these things, I'm not only mentioning them. One of our sisters who traveled to the States shared her story when she had to go there with about three of her children and was reading her PhD because the husband had passed. She said, Pastor Victor, I have survived here because of the white church I am part of. So the way they take care of my children. The mother's here. The sister's here. You know what it means to go through giving birth to a first child, a second child, whatever. Isn't it possible to have a system where simply because we know you've given birth, we can find out whether there's a family member coming. When we get to realize there's nobody coming, I can spare some three hours of my day on Saturdays just to come and help with some babysitting so you can sleep a bit. Amen then, please. There was a point where a family did something like that to us at home, and my wife also started doing it for others. In a moment when she was not well, the families cooked and brought food to us. And it was so much. We kept some in the fridge and ate it for a number of days. When she recovered, she started doing it for others as well. Last but one. Is it possible that when somebody is bereaved, do you know why traditionally they will not let them stay alone? It's not because of a spirit. 
psychologically when you are very clear, will not even come. All manner of strange dreams, not because any demon is chasing you. Is it possible to have a church that can leave your nice air-conditioned room and go and spend one night with that family? Tomorrow it will be another brother. It's so inconvenient, and that's why I call the sacrifice. And finally, is it possible that after church, you can look at that young man who plays the keyboard? I said, it's a long time I saw you. I know the last time you were talking about work issues. Can you take this hundred cities for transport? This is the word of the Lord to us. I am praying that in our own small ways, we'll find various ways to walk in practical love. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Just a few seconds. Can you please respond to this in prayer? Taking advantage to show that much love. Maybe you feel you have not been loved. Pray to the Lord to heal your heart that, that is unloved and give you the motivation to freely show love. Help me that from today, I can also make a contribution. I'm not always thinking just about myself, but how I can be of help to somebody else. Paying somebody school fees, not because I have much, but because I know that at least I can do a little. Gracious Lord, we thank you for these words. These will mean nothing if at the end of the day, your spirit does not help us to rise up and run with them. Show us the different avenues that exist so that our love will not just be in words. Our love will be in tangible actions, ready to be inconvenienced because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate you joining our service today. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking on the logo and don't forget to like and share. See you next week. God bless you.